So hello and welcome. My name is Jonathan Zittrin, and uh, I think in my capacity as the librarian of the Harvard Law Library in the left ventricle of the heart of which we sit right now, the treasure room, um, I'm so pleased to welcome you all to uh, this uh, reception and event uh, commemorating the success of the Digital Public Library of America and the welcoming of its new director, John Bracken. Welcome, John. Uh, Boston is fond of thinking of itself, I don't know how others think of it, as a city of ideas, uh, city of the mind, city of teaching and of learning, and uh, for America, a city that is one of the oldest and thinks perhaps to the farthest horizon and among librarians, that's a lot of what we are doing as well. And the Digital Public Library of America, I think, was intended as much as sort of uh, a continuity machine, a way of preserving and amplifying the things we found so valuable within uh, the four corners of libraries, as much as it was a new and transformative uh, play uh, to take libraries into the next century. And of course, it's, it's both. And in our first panel, you're going to hear from uh, the folks who really thought about this stuff and gave rise to the DPLA. Um, it's my pleasure to dwell a bit on uh, John Bracken himself. And for those of you who may be confused, I don't mean the longest serving premier of Manitoba. <laughs> so for those of you hoping to meet him, You'll be disappointed to hear he died in 1969. But rather, and we got the better of this deal, our John Bracken, somebody who, including in such places as the MacArthur Foundation and the Knight Foundation, it's been his job to see possibility, often where others are not quite seeing it yet about themselves, how to elicit that kind of imagination and creativity and then execution as he worked on various grant projects and portfolios, swaying, encouraging, the kind of person that if you ever had to give John a call, including occasionally with less than good news as the guy who might be writing the checks, to know that on the other end of the phone was somebody who would hear you out and you'd come away with some solution that you hadn't even thought of to the problem you hadn't realized you had, uh, that's a very rare quality. And it's one I think that will serve John and the DPLA so well as he's taking up his new post. And I think uh, if we're being pithy about what the DPLA is, a, no a number of people just see it as kind of a digitization play, and I don't mean to put that in minimizing quotes. There's something so deeply empowering about the idea of taking that which is in a room like this and making it available to anybody, whether or not they can beat a path to this door and make it through our turnstile, but also to think more generally about the values behind libraries, the embrace of truth, the concept of the availability of education for people, regardless of their station, of their money, of whether they're looking for certification or not. And these values, I think, are fairly self-evident in an era like today um, where perhaps they are implicitly or even explicitly under attack. So uh, I'm just so glad to have a group like this gathered for this. In the spirit of designated survivor, I believe John Palfrey is not here, but uh, may make a brief appearance and someone else may be asked to step out while that happens. So there's continuity should something go wrong. Um, but uh, minus John, among all the folks in this room, Nearly all of you have had some really great hand in bringing about what uh, has so many moving parts, is so much about relationships among libraries, not just dealing with, say, materials or technologies. So our first group of folks to kind of reflect a little bit on the origin and the trajectory of the DPLA includes John himself. So come on up, John. And uh, given that we have two chairs and three people, um, I'm going to designate you as our designated stander. Yes, the stander bearer, as it were. Um, and we have Mara Marks and Bob Darton. 
Bob Darton University librarian here speaking with such a resonant and passionate and anchored voice, somebody with a compass that has served this university, this nation, and the world so well. I'm just so excited uh, to see Bob's reflections here. And Mara Marks, who has been so deeply involved in all aspects, not only of the DPLA, but of the funding establishments, the constitutive establishments of our national and ultimately world network of libraries. And I just know after hearing from them, we will be reminded of just how vital these institutions and these people they comprise are to a healthy, vibrant, growing, fair, and just, I have to work that in in the law school, uh, society. So uh, John, over to you, and uh, Bob and Marka, come on up and join us. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. So we're gonna trade, you guys should take the chairs. We're gonna trade microphones back and forth. Um, thank you, Jay-Z. It, it means a lot uh, to be here at Harvard Law Library and to be with the Berkman Center. Uh, it means a lot to me, personally and professionally. This is a place that I've taken so much from over the years, uh, and it's so important to DPLA and the origins of, of DPLA. So speaking of, Moore and Bob, you were both on the original steering committee. You were there before it was even an idea. Um, and, and thank you guys. I'm, I guess apologies a little bit. Indulge me. You know, this is as I'm onboarding and, and sort of tr orienting in my new job, I get this opportunity to interview these two folks who helped bake this thing that, that exists that we on the staff are now charged with helping to succeed. Um, what, were you, what were you thinking? What was the sort of original light bulb moment you had? What brought you to the table? You know, I think it was probably almost uh, exactly eight years ago that you guys had the first, maybe seven and a half years ago, you had the first meeting here in, at Harvard. Um, what, what, what was the impulse? Bobby, let's start with you. Uh, well, it's a long story, but it's a collective. that would out-Google Google and do it in the public interest. In a way, though, it did begin, I, I don't know if you'd agree, Mara, with Google because they began digitizing books in 2004. And at first, it looked like a great idea, at least it, it did to many of us, because it was to be a... Well, yeah. Did you hear me? Okay, I, I brought up the G word, Google. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the original idea was to be a search service. And so the user could, in principle, um, look up a title or an author or an idea, even on a screen, and Google would give you snippets so you could have some idea of the immediate context and then often would tell you where you could find the book in the nearest public library. We thought it was just great. And we also thought about just the sheer volume of knowledge that could be digitized at scale. So before Google did this, we were digitizing, you know, very slowly, and it was costing us, I remember, it was costing us $4 a page to digitize a book. And then suddenly Google came on the scene and was doing entire libraries. And so there was this incredible feeling of, oh my gosh, this is a moment where we can really put all knowledge online and we can do so many things. We can reach so many people and we can do large-scale data work. It was so exciting. So uh, Mara was out there at the Boston Public Library digitizing away at enormous expense. I think... Uh, <laughs> I was if, not. I'd, uh, like to, I'd like to... <laughs> like she was overpaid, as usual. Uh, Actually, I have a huge, several drawers full of folders about the origins of the DPLA. At Harvard, we began thinking about it um, actually uh, around 2007 when, when I came here, and Google asked to digitize books that were covered by copyright. That led to the uh, lawsuits. I won't go into the whole story, but uh, in... I, this, in February 2008, we created, after a big debate in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, DASH, a digital repository that would make the scholarly articles produced by the 
faculty available free of charge. And after Dash, uh, it seemed that while Google was transforming its search service into what turned out to be a proposal for a commercial library, we thought maybe, you know, we could do something along those lines. Uh, my first proposal was actually in April 2013, a, a memo I sent out trying to combine the research collections of Harvard, the New York Public Library, and the Library of Congress. And one memo after another fell flat. I actually, Sarah, got a rather poor reception by other people in the Harvard Library. But finally, in um, it, it was April 2000, uh, um, no, it was two, April 2009, I sent a letter out to heads of foundations, heads of libraries, and computer scientists inviting them to attend a meeting uh, at Harvard, which took place on October 1st, 2010. And that's where we really began to make it happen. And that's where you came into the picture. Mark. And, and many others. And that's during that time, you know, you described so well what was happening at Harvard. There was so much going on in the country. So the Open Content Alliance had been formed and Brewster Kale and the Internet Archive was, you know, bringing libraries together, thinking about open digitization and non-commercial digitization. The Boston Library Consortium was very active, I'm proud to say. Boston was right out there in front. And so this was just the zeitgeist. Everyone was really thinking about how do we create this public access library? And um, Jonathan spoke so beautifully about the values of libraries. It wasn't just about the stuff. It was about working together and transcending this moment that seemed like commercial forces were sort of taking over all that we held dear. And I remember all of us at the time had PowerPoints that we used with the Boston Public Library's free to all, uh, you know, the words emblazoned over the front door. And we had a lot of images of libraries being built back in the American public library movement. So we were really thinking about what is a library for today? And then Professor Darnton got this wonderful group together. And do you want to tell that story? Yeah, I won't go into all the details, but... Um, I have the statement we, here if you want it. <laughs> well, we had a one-page uh, proposal. Uh, and after about 15 minutes, every, or there were uh, roughly 40 people at this conference said, this is a good idea, we can make it happen. And uh, in the, we, we improvised... Uh, a mission statement, which maybe you can read, Dick, can you? I will, and what, I think what's worth saying is that some of the people in that very room were uh, university library heads who were involved in the Google Books project, and even they were realizing, okay, we have to create some other alternative. So the statement that we sort of worked on all day, I'll try to be quickly, Leaders from research libraries, foundations, and a variety of cultural institutions gathered in a workshop at the Radcliffe Institute, blah, 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 in order to discuss how to work together towards the creation of a digital public library of America. That is an open, distributed network of comprehensive online resources that would draw on the nation's living heritage from libraries, universities, archives, and museums in order to educate, inform, and empower everyone in current and future generations. And there was a lot of wordsmithing that went on there because of words like empower and everyone. And, and extended. Uh, so the idea of extension meant it was to be a horizontal type organization, not a vertical one like the Library of Congress, for example. So yeah. we, we uh, appointed a steering committee. We had five major work groups. We had big public meetings in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Chicago. Uh, we had a beta sprint where 1,100 computer technicians uh, proposed ideas for the infrastructure. I mean, things just took off. The first grant came from the Sloan Foundation where Doran uh, uh, Weber was a big supporter. It was $150,000 for the first four months. And the Berkman Center, with people like Jonathan Zetrain, uh, got deeply involved. So the, the momentum built up at a terrific pace. And on April 13th, 13th, wasn't it, 2013, 13th. Yep. 
uh, we launched and things did not crash. <laughs> they took off. So, one more exciting thing, because there's so many exciting things about this, was that big tent approach. And it really felt like maybe this was the, what Berkman Center brought to uh, the project. It was sort of a neutral but very engaged place to, to act as a home. So it would have been different had one library really said, okay, we're the, we're the center of this DPLA. But Berkman infused its own values into the DPLA, and so it took on this very open, welcoming, um, entrepreneurial uh, sort of, what am I looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, spirit. So, okay, I'll be quiet now. You can ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing exactly what I want to do, but I'm going to steal your okay. microphone to ask a question. Um, so that was 2010, 2011. This is 2018. It's a different world. I mean, I think we think differently about information. We have new lessons about the role of the Internet as a force in society. Um, I think we've seen a new set of energy and entrepreneurship coming from a lot of uh, traditional institutions, including libraries. How, as you think, reflect back on those early meetings, you know, how do you think about where we are today? What conversations would we be having today if we were found, founding a digital public library of America that maybe you didn't have in 2010? Well, to begin, um, I could mention two things that we, at least I, had not anticipated at the beginning. The first was the importance of public librarians. I mean, I confess that as a uh, scholar, I tended to think of the DPLA as something that would link up research libraries. It had a broad mission, but I myself, it was a weak point on my part, imagined serious scholars drawing on this uh, digitized base. No, the public librarians jumped in at our first big meetings. They were extremely active. And in all of the annual meetings we've had since, I would say that the heart of the DPLA is with public librarians. Um, it's been fascinating to see how they took the initiative, developed things uh, as they wanted them to develop. And the second uh, unanticipated direction that we took was toward public education. So there are sort of course packets which a DPLA provides to public schools everywhere. Uh, we've cooperated with the National Public Broadcasting. In 2015, uh, President Obama uh, helped launch a project to bring e-books to uh, poorer neighborhoods in certain areas. And the whole kind of educational mission uh, developed in a rather unanticipated way. So that's, again, going back into the past. It could be that Maura has ideas about the future. I agree with you on your points. And, uh, you know, the public librarians, I would say, are just representative of that activist platform that public libraries are today for all communities. And so I think... A DPLA has to think about that, you know, their role as a neutral, trusted, um, accurate, you know, a, a place where um, where the truth can be told or will be told. And I, you, you were at night, so maybe you were thinking about truthiness in news. I, you know, we maybe we were thinking more about information quality, but we, I was not thinking about large-scale attacks on. Um, on facts and things, and I think libraries have an important role to play there. Um, I think what, again, going back to the excitement is you have this platform and you have an ability to bring people together around this trusted, uh, time-tested uh, institution and use that. So, so if I try to peer into the future, I have enough problems forecasting the past, not to mention the future. Says the eminent historian. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's one thing that occurs to me. I've been reading a lot of books that deal with fake news, hoaxes, and so-called digital silos produced by the new social media, which did not exist when we first began. 
I think it would be great if the DPLA could think of a way for face-to-face -face contact that would supplement the digital contact that goes on. And this could be done through the service hubs, which are now very active in many of the states. I think they could sponsor such uh, contacts and it would reinforce things because I honestly believe face-to-face -face improvised contact between real human beings is terribly effective. I'd like to also just put in a, a pitch for real access still. I think that's still an issue. So broad public access to knowledge and to materials is still an issue. And, you know, the Open eBooks project is a great start. Um, but a DPLA can do an awful lot to close the digital divide today and I think has made progress in the last years and picking that up and running with it is, is going to be important. Another thing I've mentioned to you, John, is maybe the DPLA, which as probably most of you know, has a very small staff. I mean, it's not a bureaucracy at all, but it might think of developing a department, a foreign affairs department, because everywhere I go, especially in Latin America and Europe, people want to develop their own DPLAs, and there are many other organizations, but um, not just Europeana. I think especially in countries like Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, uh, there is tremendous eagerness to be part of this, and they say, why don't you call it the Digital Public Library of the Americas. Uh, so that's something you might think of. You need money to staff it, etc. But I think we're getting close to the point where we will have a world digital library integrating all of these different systems. So in this, I've got lots of questions, but in the spirit of the participatory platform that that we started off as. I want to make sure if folks have questions that they want to ask any of us, especially these two eminent leaders, to um, catch my eye. Um, I, one thing I will ask for now is um, in the last couple minutes, um, one of the things I saw on that agenda for that first 2010 meeting, there was policy was a major component of those discussions. Copyright, orphan works, um, and I wonder how you think we, not just we at DPLA, but we as a field, should be thinking differently today about some of the copyright conversations that you were having then. Have, has the ball moved? Have we made progress? I don't see a lot of, uh, we have not had a lot of discussions about what's our orphan work strategy, for instance, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. This one you leave for me to start? You've got... <laughs> Um, it was central to the beginning. I mean, I think one of the founding ideas was that the last century was totally omitted from digital libraries because of orphan works, uh, because it was too risky to digitize orf orphan works. And I think there's been a little bit of progress made in that direction. Uh, libraries are digitizing something. Go ahead. Well... Yes, I mean, one of the five work groups was about legal problems in copyright. And we, frankly, faced the fact with a lot of lawyerly support that we would have to eliminate most of the 20th century literature. So virtually everything after 1923 was out of bounds. And that was not encouraging. We worried about orphan works. We worried about the copyright office and how it was being run. And... Um, we thought maybe you could get modifications to the Copyright Act of 1976, etc. It became clear very soon that Congress would not help. So the big shift that began, it actually began in Michigan, with court cases. So I think case law is evolving around the famous Clause uh, 107, and m Fair use is expanding, case by case. So the, that's the only hope I see, frankly, uh, th th unless you have a better idea, Mark. No, but, you know, this was one of the things I think that was in the, we talked about a lot in the beginning was an organization that is separate from being, that is not just one single library can be a little more of a risk taker than a single library. 
And so maybe a lightweight organization like a DPLA can do some things that push the envelope. And I think, again, uh, Brewster Kale at the Internet Archive has been pushing those, those limits. He's, he's now working under Section 108H to um, uh, scan and publish uh, orphan works between 24 and 41 that are not actively uh, being sold or something. So, you know, he's pushing all the time. And I think finding he ways... Has, he hasn't changed. <laughs> he has not changed. This is still a mission. So finding ways to push and, you know, it, maybe enticing a little more risk on, in libraries, maybe that's... I can say comfortably since I'm not sitting in a library. <laughs> well, we have lots of experts in yeah. this room about yeah. copyright and so on. Maybe they could pitch in, too. Yes. Well, that Mary? Mary? Go for okay. Thank you, Mary. I think Maura's point, though, is very important, that the DPLA can take risks that individual institutions cannot. Certainly at Harvard, we're run by lawyers. Um, and, the, and they're good lawyers. They're, they're public-spirited and so on, but they are a terrific drag if you want to innovate in any way. Um, so I'm, I'm for taking risks and a public, a broad public interest organization like the DPLA can be the, the, the kind of organization that would step over the line and take some chances with copyright. Yeah, we used to say, who would want to sue 200 libraries? That, I mean, it, that's a, I love the exhortation to take more risks. That, I'm happy to end that there. That's really great. Um, does anyone have a question while we have these two leaders? Yeah, please. Sorry, I'm Tom Blake from Boston Public. Um, we have always thought of copyright from the legal perspective and not the business perspective. I think there's also an opportunity to um, re-engage publishers. And so, for example, and this is it might sound self-serving, but um, we have the, the Houghton Mifflin back catalog uh, at the BPL, and they actually just gave us permission to digitize that entire collection in, in a certain way. Um, but it turns out there's, there's business reasons for that. So we don't have to worry about the legal issues. We actually reached out and we're being nice to each other and we're gonna move forward with that. I think that is the perfect time to make our transition to our next conversation. You guys, thank you both so much. Thanks for being such great supporters. Um, while we transition, I'll invite David and Mary and, and Nico to come on down. And I'll start with in my introduction of Mary Minow, who, among other things, besides being a fellow at the Berkman Center, is one of my bosses at DPLA, thankfully. Come on, come on down. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, Amy Ryan, the chair of our board, who is here, who now I can't see where she is. Uh, and Brian Bannon is here from Chicago as well in the back row. And I'm scanning to make sure I'm not missing any other of my bosses. Um, but thank you, and, and that exhortation, Bob, of taking risks is something they're responsible for digesting and helping, helping us work through. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce my friend Nico Melli, who runs the Shorenstein Center down the road, who I will just preface by saying he's got a great library origin story, should he, share, should he care to share it. W which one is that? The one about your birth in West Africa. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, but that's kind of a long story, so <laughs> maybe we will uh, ask me at the ask me at the reception. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think of John Bracken as my boss in many ways, uh, intellectual and otherwise. It's a real delight. I was thinking uh, I'm right now reading Vartan Gregorian's autobiography, and one of the things he talks in there that when he wants to know about the future. When he thinks about where we're going, he turns to teachers, librarians, and journalists. And I thought, ha, huh, I'm a teacher, here's a journalist, and there's a librarian. <laughs> so um, uh, to my left is David Beard, a media executive and contributor to pointer.org, former foreign correspondent, Director of Digital at the Washington Post, editor of Boston.com, 
uh, 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 executive of PRI. He's been uh, a well-known and prominent journalist for some time. And uh, most recently was a fellow with the Shorenstein Center studying journalism and libraries. Very excited to have him here with us. And um, Mary Minow is a fellow with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Uh, she was a public librarian and then a library law consultant. And as you heard, she's on the board of the Digital Public Library of America, as well as uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the agency that is the primary source of federal grants for the nation's libraries. So it's a pleasure to have them both here. I'm going to start with a question for Mary. Um, uh, you know, one of the things we've been hearing a lot about in the current moment is a decline in trust in public institutions, uh, whether that be the media or political parties or I dare say Congress, or I think I have to say, given today, the FBI. Uh, what, and yet Americans really trust their libraries. What, what's going on there and what, what role could libraries play in our democracy? Yes. Uh, libraries beat out your neighbors, your family, your medical providers. We're at the top. We're st still not, still not over, over, you know, seventy percent, but we're, we're we're better than anyone else. Um, so, what what is the role of the trust? What can we do with that trust? I think it's it's our time. It, we should seize this moment when everybody is distrusting the media to to use that trust. To, to add a veneer of credibility to the underlying publications. When I talk with librarians in some of the rural areas where there's less trust of the media, um, I ask them, do you still have that trust? And they say, yes. In fact, in small areas, uh, the, lo the local librarian's known by everybody, has high, high trust. But when I give them the, the media, it doesn't really help. They still don't trust the New York Times. They don't trust the Washington Post. What role can libraries play on media literacy for communities? Well, every single day I get a Google News alert on um, what libraries are doing. And uh, I checked it this morning, and there's programs going on right now at Ferndale, Michigan, Billings, Montana, Dodge City, St. Cloud. It, 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 at the grassroots level, there are programs going on all the time to teach people uh, media literacy. What is happening at the national level is also inspiring. The American Library Association is working with um, St Stony Brook uh, to do pilots on teaching media literacy at the library. And, and assuming this goes well, which it is so far, they're doing, they are doing some video testing right now. They would like to scale it up and are, would be looking for funding at that point. Um, but it's a much deeper problem than, than, than a, really a Band-Aid approach. The article that haunts me is by Dana Boyd, Did Media Literacy Backfire? I read it every week <laughs> because she says that we're fooling ourselves if we think just teaching media literacy is the answer when it's a deep structural problem. And I'm really excited. I've had a number of talks with David uh, to, 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 to look at the deeper issues. Nevertheless, what gives me hope with the media literacy front with libraries is a Pew study that came out on September 11th that divides us into five information-seeking groups. And 13% of us, 13% of us um, would like to be more digitally literate and don't trust the media, but would, would, are prime candidates for the libraries to, to reach out to. Uh, that's in the center. At the top, 40% or so are already coming into the library, learning digital skills, learning on their own, um, and then the bottom 50% don't know, don't care. Wow. Wow. What, what has surprised you most in your work with libraries over the last few years uh, in terms of their engagement with communities and, and uh, with media literacy? What surprises me is when, I, when I've talked to them about this project that I'm working with with the Berkman Center, the, the Law Library, and Boston Public, and um, about reaching out beyond the library to that 13% using Facebook to say, um, not so sure about that article that your, your friend posted, connect with a librarian to help you check it out. I say to librarians, I say, if this really works and we scale it and we tell people, here's your local library, would you be okay with taking more, more questions? And they're like, yes, yes, we, that's what we do. We want to answer people's questions and how to figure out the authenticity of an article and how to figure out a broader view. That's, you know, and I ask people you know, in really small areas, yeah, I, I always get a yes. That surprises Excellent. me. 
Uh, I'm going to turn to David now. Um, I would highly recommend everyone, David, is a recent piece uh, published, I guess, just uh, a couple of days ago in The Atlantic on libraries and small town news. And the piece opens with uh, the story of a, of a tragic school shooting in Cleveland. Can you tell us that story and tell us what that means? Sure. Um, it was a, a student had come into the cafeteria before school and had fired. There was a CNN alert, but an alum of the school, Marilyn Johnson, who some of you may know from her book, uh, this book is overdue, I think, about uh, librarians and cyberians and the future libraries, uh, was from Chardon, Ohio. And she saw the most accurate uh, subsequent reports, fact-based, substantial, in this emergency situation from the Facebook page of her library, what, where the vigil will be. What the, and, and, and it struck her because, you know, she... Uh, her book was less than two years, just two years old at this time, how she had overlooked um, that the information center of a community would be the information disseminator for the community too. It's a, it's a non-traditional role and uh, in some ways, other than the flyers on the event coming up or which author will be in town. But um, the other piece of the puzzle was everybody else was gone. The local paper was gone. The, the, the representative for that town from the big paper now has to cover 15 communities instead of two. So uh, even in communities like Skokie, uh, close to Chicago, vibrant, you know, there's a, there's a total dearth. You would Mike Berkeley, news deserts, you know. So um, I, I wanted to see what librarians, if anything, were doing to sort of fill that vacuum. And what, what did you find? I know, talk a little bit about South Dakota. Oh, yeah. So, well, I, I feel like I was just following some of John Bracken's early grants with, uh, in San, San Antonio or maybe in South Dakota uh, to see if a uh, few of these pioneers had survived the shakeout of hyperlocal and citizen journalists. And in, um, in South Dakota, uh, a visionary state library board member uh, saw a chance to unite 13 libraries and create a website and, uh, and deliver some news, but based on, not on a police blotter, but based on changes in census uh, data town by town or changes in, in, um, in GDP information, just, just material that would be very vibrant, important for officials and others to make good decisions in government. That wasn't being done. And then as weeklies closed, the other stuff wasn't being done too. So, um, so uh, the Black Hills uh, Information Network became sort of a de facto information source for uh, a chunk of uh, Northwest South Dakota. And as we're facing a future where uh, the number of uh, journalists in the United States is uh, at about 20, uh, 18 to 20 percent, the level it was at 14 years ago. Uh, we're seeing just a really rapid decline in the volume and availability of local news. What what do libraries have to bring to that vacuum? What do they have that maybe journalists and newsrooms don't have? Um, trust is the first thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you know Paola Villanueva from Creative Commons and a Berkman uh, fellow. Uh, she said, you're just trying to bring get journalists and librarians to date each other. And I said... Well, if they had a love child, it would have an approval rating in the 60s. But, um, but so trust is a big component. Um, and, and active listening and understanding of, of, of the audience and understanding of the authenticity of each community. I, I've been loath to start top-down templates for success for various people because I want to listen to see what solutions have been done on a menu of options by the pioneering libraries that are doing things, stepping into this. Um, I think that uh, as in journalism, uh, librarians understand uh, what makes their community different and ask the question, although some might call it a Passover question about why is this town different from any other town? Um, every moment, every day, every aspect from history to disproportionate statistical representation. So in the section of information um, that is about that local area, uh, I think librarians, libraries have a much better handle 
than out-of-town chain places that are paying some stranger to come in at age 22 to figure out a town. Mary, I just wonder if you want to comment on this, on this role that libraries are, are, are beginning to fill in different ways. Well, Dave and I have been talking a lot about the structural problems of um, the, the closing of these small papers makes people in small towns say, we don't have a voice. We're being preached to by the elites on the coast, and, and the, the resentment and the divide grows wider. So I think that what libraries have to offer um, is, is manifold. We've been passing around some ideas of having a resident journalist, a, you know, stay, stay in the library and be there to, 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 write question, to write stories and answer questions and teach literacy, news literacy. And what does the library can offer back is um, some space, some expertise, the local files, the contacts. There's, there's, libraries have amazing tap on resources um, that, that journalists could actually learn from the librarians. This could be a really good partnership. I would add that the journalists would think, and there, there are some really great outreach people in libraries that, libraries that get this too, uh, the, the idea of broader dissemination of, of, of what you have and, and a selectivity of, for the audience, which let's say you've got uh, like, like, uh, um, like BPL, you know, 63 invaluable databases. Who's your audience? And will, will database 37 with this particular use case light up and get these people to go from the list of, of databases to the muscle memory to use it more often? So, so I, think, I think journalists are good at getting the word out um, for that. And, and I think there is a, a, a new sort of digital specialist or outreach specialist or whoever is doing the weekly newsletter, email newsletter for the library that will be, become much more muscular, I think, in, in coming years. And so the new role of a community library uh, may evolve into just a de facto town crier. It won't just be library events. It'll be library plus town events, too, because there wasn't the other side anymore. You know, and, and libraries, at least public libraries, the role has been changing to be less of a repository, although it's certainly a huge value in that, but more of a content creation space for their users. So as maker spaces come into play, as recording studios, as, as poetry labs, um, there, there really is a, a synergy there for creation of local, local content. And I would also, I mean, the other impetus for me is this is sort of a rear guard action to protect some aspect of the First Amendment in areas where it has either been gone or, or the news desert. It's, it's sort of a seeding of, of an area, of a, of a barren area in some cases. And if there is greater interest in local um, sort of accountability journalism that would be on the you know, ken of the library if they're paid by, people are paid by the mayor, um, that you may stoke a kind of community that could support a broader, different news news thing again. So this is this is happening, and this could happen, I imagine, in communities far from uh, the battles in Washington over the press or uh, or other places. This is this is uh, the this is red America. These are small town America. This is places where um, uh, they they hate journalists because they didn't have a local journalist. Much like unbridled hatred for Congress, except for your local congressman that we took out the local congressman here from media. Uh, I have a couple more questions, but maybe I should just open it up to the audience for a moment and see if there are any questions from the audience. And if not, I will keep going. Speak now. Yes. Excuse me for speaking up, uh, having just spoken in the previous panel, but David, I'm a little skeptical about the library as a newspaper. Uh, I, it seems to me that people like you, journalists, have real skills and you write stories. Now, it's true that libraries are centers for information and they can help people get there, but it seems to me the problem is much more profound than leaning harder on libraries. 62% uh, of Americans get their news from the social media, mainly um, uh, Facebook. 
And the, the stuff that comes onto that media is not produced by trained professionals who know how to get a story. So it seems to me we are stuck in a very severe crisis as far as news goes. Right. I, I'm, I'm, your point is taken. I don't think that um, there, there are a few places where the librarian, town librarian has ended up running, in essence, the town weekly newspaper, but it's, it's four or eight pages, you know, uh, two, two 11 by 17 uh, uh, pages folded together and dropped off at a few local spots. It is mostly it was what I would call proto-journalism. It's not, it's not the deep stuff. It's just this town's um, senior, seniors club didn't realize this town also had a seniors exercise club. And so all of a sudden when you have the announcements going out, they're doubling the size of people that show up for the kids Santa Lions Club thing. It's a very fundamental first edge of, of community. So I, I don't see it as, a, as New York Times journals. I don't know what to do. Uh, um, some parts of that 62% in social media. I do know that, that, uh, that local information is not as replicable or as representative. People will know in a second when, uh, when Elvis died but they won't know who owned your house in 1960. You know, so you need to have a local database to get that. So it may be unearthing, some, unlocking the unique information that each community might have. And I want to add to that. I mean, it's certainly not investigative journalism or, or high-level uh, output. But the problem is so severe that having just these scenes in the ground, I think, is important. We have nothing in, in so many spaces. So to have something that then can perhaps start to grow and, and journalists might come back, or you know, we've got, it's better than a fallow field, is how, how I see it. What, what other challenges do you see facing, uh, facing libraries in um, the... Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. Um, what do we do with all this junk? I mean, do, do, do we, how do we curate this? Do we collect it? Do we believe in, in access to everything? Or do we don't believe in labeling things? Um, when it came to Holocaust denial literature, you wouldn't believe how much time and thought and arguments went into coming up with a, with a call number to keep it separate. And that was not even a, really an, a, 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 that was an objective uh, distinction, whether it's denying or whether it's actually Holocaust literature. So how do we handle this? How do we curate uh, with, and keep that trustworthiness and still have free to all access? That's, the Simmons is having a conference in April, no news, K-N-O-W-N-E-W-S, to deal with that problem and to bring together technologists, journalists, and librarians to figure out how to, how to move forward. I was going to say also there, there's a lot of interest uh, in, in various schools who have contacted me after a few of these stories and have said, we, we, we see we need some skills that journalists have in our iSchools. And iSchools would say we need some of, uh, or um, um, journalism schools would say we need some of these skills that, uh, that you know, information science and library science people have as well. And there may be a hybrid with new next gen employees in libraries if they have to do a little, I guess, extreme outreach or sort of answering the existential question. Um, maybe it's somebody who has both the, the research and, and um, tools and the sort of uh, some dissemination skills. I, I don't know if it's more than a team taught course or if it's a, to a joint degree on the spectrum. And when I think forward to the role of libraries, I really look to the Digital Public Library of America because um, it's creating that curate that one spot, at least, where there's curated, reputable content that is so important. And if we spend all our time just slashing at the stuff that's bad, that's what we're that's we'll end up with nothing. I think building the good content is the best role, the highest role for libraries. I, I had a friend who was uh, in college in the Vietnam War and was disbelieving everything he was reading in the paper. So he went to the library, he opened up all the books, and he found out the li that the, what he was reading was lies. We need, we need that going forward. How, how is he going to find those books um, unless we have some, some reputable uh, DPLA-type platform? One last question. Yes, sir, in the back. So I would like your comments on uh, an experiment that's a little over a year uh, underway at BPL right now, which was kind of the final piece of the, the renovation that, that was started under Amy Ryan's leadership. And that's where we have WGBH now with a full broadcast studio for news and radio in 
inside the central library. That's of value to PBH to bring you know, new uh, listeners and viewers of the radio, yes, viewers of the radio, um, <laughs> uh, in person um, to the library, but it's also drawing others to the library who wouldn't have been aware of this before. So it's, it's another piece of the you know, reinvention of the library that brings together news in this new form and traditional information services. David, could I ask you the question, how is it working after that first year? I, it's working so well for me, I can't pass Boylston without taking a picture of the news feed cafe and posting it to my Instagram feed. I don't know why. But uh, I, I'm hoping it work, it's working out well. So this will be a trusted piece of this as well that you were you yeah. um, So uh, people love it. Um, both uh, the, 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 the mayor was on this morning, and it's always a draw. And um, you know, to have people participating in the radio show in person um, by asking questions, being in dialogue. Um, I think you know, for years two and year three, the question is now, what do we do with this as a platform? Is there a way to bring about uh, an interesting opportunity for uh, training people on what, what is good journalism, how do you produce a show, um, what is the role of news within the library context? And people have come to the library to read newspapers for generations, so this is a new form of that. Um, so I think we're still in the early stages of working out what that means, but, but the promise is very encouraging, and the response is I would I would say, maybe if you haven't already, to look at uh, at uh, the San Antonio uh, system and the uh, studios that they have primarily for training uh, with the teen services division and uh, the sort of independent sort of video C-SPAN for uh, San Antonio that's all produced in a newsroom inside of that main library building. So I think uh, our panelists have done an excellent job of trying to uh, with wisdom light the way towards the future a bit. I mean we're facing this giant rushing flow of dis and misinformation on social media, in part, I believe, because of the collapse of journalism. And libraries have a role both in navigating some of the challenges of mis and disinformation and in, in providing a potential future for some communities, at least, on, um, on, on local news. And I thought since Mary had the foresight and wisdom to bring up Poetry Labs. I thought it'd be worth closing with a, a couple of brief stanzas from Mark Strand. Um, <clears throat> there is no happiness like mine. Ink runs from the corners of my mouth. I have been eating poetry. And the last stanza is, I am a new man. I growl at the librarian and bark. I romp with joy in the bookish dark. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to try not to cross the streams. Thanks, you guys. Um, so I'm going to move out the, th the third chair, but I'll ask uh, Philip Schmidt from the MIT Media Lab, who just this week announced the Public Library Innovation Exchange, which he'll tell us about, um, and Jocelyn Kennedy from right here at Harvard, the Executive Director of the Harvard Law Library, um, to bring us home. You guys, you guys should go where you want. I'll get out of the way, so I'm just going to take this one. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> we didn't get a moderator. We also got very little instruction, and so... <laughs> So we started shooting emails back and forth, saying, here's, here's what I'm interested in, and then an email came back. And I think after listening to the previous panels, there are two areas that, that still stand out for me that I would love to talk to you about, and also talk about myself a little bit. Um, one is this relationship between uh, virtual and face-to-face. -face. Uh, came up in the first panel, it's kind of what is the role of a virtual or a digital library? What is the role of the, the place? And then the other one is, um, and maybe we start there, is the library as a platform. So partnerships with uh, journalists or other kinds of organizations. And I know there's a, um, a library innovation lab here at Harvard, uh, and you're working with public libraries and I think also academic libraries. And so I'm curious, and we have this public library innovation exchange, so maybe we, should get, we could just share some experiences. Sure. 
No, no, I've already been talking for you. No, you go, you go first. But you have such a lovely voice. Um, so we do, we have an innovation lab here, and I think that's, um, we've worked with vendors, we've worked with lots of other people to get content. It's a really interesting, we're working with BPL right now to get some of our, uh, to have a shared digital collection, which I think is going to be amazing, and some other academic libraries as well. One of the things that you had emailed me about, that's a question that I'm interested in talking about, I think, was sort of what is the role of an academic library in relation to the public library? And of course, I shot back, like, where do we live in the digital space? So um, I'm gonna could I answer your question about sort of where I see academic libraries and, and public libraries? I'm not in charge. And then I want to talk to you about, well, we're, but we're having this conversation. I don't want to ask you something you don't want to answer. Um, and then I, I'm interested to hear from you sort of what's happening at the Media Lab, because I think that's a really interesting um, project, the work that you're doing there. So um, the question about what can academic libraries do with public libraries is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I'm a passionate believer in public libraries, and lots of people tell me that I, they think I'm a public librarian. I've never actually worked in a um, non-academic public library, which is weird. Um, I probably should be doing that. So I, I think there's a huge role for academic libraries in relation to public libraries in a couple of areas. And the one that I'm sort of really passionate about right now is sort of thinking about how we help young people um, in libraries sort of come to academia, right? How do we help? There's a huge role for academic libraries to play in public libraries. I would love to send my librarians into public libraries to work with public librarians and to work with um, all library patrons because they're future college attendees, right, regardless of their age, um, to help them learn how to use resources, to think about information literacy, to think about what Mary's talking about, about media literacy, to think about what the world looks like beyond their small space. Um, I think that's one area where we can help. And then the innovation lab, sort of as we're, we're looking at ways that we can extend information out to the public. So uh, one of our big projects right now, and I'm pointing to Jack Cushman because it's one of the things he's going to be working on and has been working on, is the Case Law Access Project, which I'm sure lots of you have heard about, where we've digitized um, all of the case law of the United States of America. But the next piece of it is like, now that we've done that, what do we do with that information? It's not simply enough to have digitized the content. We're extending access, and what does that mean? And there's lots of different ways to consider that. Um, one is from an academic standpoint, so that re researchers can manipulate and look at ontologies um, and things like that. I'm seriously interested in how we use that information to help a 14-year-old kid who lives on a reservation in the middle of America provided that Susan Crawford does her good work and gets him, inter him or her internet access, is trying to help their parent with a legal issue, right? Or a child, I'm sort of very focused on younger people, a child who um, is the only native English speaker in their family who's helping um, with an eviction problem or something. So those are some ways that um, I think we can enter that public library space. Yeah, and in some ways, um, I think this experience you've had with between academic libraries and public libraries. At the Media Lab, we had this hypothesis that there would be a connection between Media Lab students and public libraries. And we um, uh, essentially reached out to the Media Lab community and said, uh, we're building this relationship with public libraries. We already have a relationship with some of the leading ones in the US. And we'd like to hear who's interested in working with public libraries. And the response has been kind of almost overwhelming. Uh, and so uh, actually my colleague Catherine, who's sitting in the back there, and I, who are running this project, um, we uh, brought on board a librarian, because we're not librarians. We wanted to make sure that we really understand that perspective, someone from the MIT library uh, who came on board with the project. And then we started talking to the libraries about what are the kinds of programs or services would they be interested in uh, developing with someone from the Media Lab. And we started talking to the Media Lab uh, folks, uh, saying, what are you working on? And is there a, a connection to public libraries? And what we heard uh, from many of them is, you know, we at, and I think probably many of you have a sense of what the Media Lab does. We're about three or 400 people. We build a, a, a lot of technology. We're very technology and innovation focused. and. For many of our students, it turned out the, most, uh, the thing that they were most interested in with public libraries is getting closer to the communities, getting closer to real people, uh, uh, working with an institution that's trusted in the community so that they could then 
we use the term deploy, but it's really more co-develop their technologies with these communities to make sure that they actually make sense, that people want to use them, that they get value out of them. And so we've been uh, kind of matching up these researchers with public libraries, and we're excited to do some things that I think haven't necessarily been done a lot in libraries before, including uh, building a CubeSat satellite that's going to get launched into space and send back data, uh, or doing learning research where actually the librarians and the media lab researchers together do the research. So the library becomes a, a place of research uh, rather than just uh, getting programs from vendors or, or outside partners. So I think this, this kind of this interface between innovators and, and new types of partners and, and public libraries is really interesting. and, and uh, well, yeah, I think the media lab is just, I think you, we, we're just the beginning of, of this, right? Like there are lots of other organizations that I think we should try to get involved um, into this. Isn't it interesting how, um, how excited librarians are to be learners? Have you found that interesting? Uh, I mean, they are, like, the, the, they're, they are the learners, right? Uh, so we love working with them because... Uh, they are so curious, but also they are, um, I think in the media lab sometimes, because we put technology first, mm -hmm. or often first, right, we kind of like run ahead with this technology. And we have found that the librarians are certain, bring kind of a, a thoughtfulness, a groundedness into the conversation that also has, for us, has been really, really uh, amazing. It pulls in the balance between that sort of push towards innovation and and, and a little bit maybe more... The word that's coming to my head is sensibility, and I don't mean that pejoratively towards innovators, right? But there is some sensibility when you're building something for a space. Is it really going to work? When we have that big vision of what it could be, does it actually fit within whatever the, the box or the parameters of the actual people are? So that's, I, I'm excited. We should talk more about what we could do together. Um, so yes. you said something about what, I, what I'm really interested in is this notion of community. Like, I'm, I'm thrilled to know that you're... Um, that your students are really wanting to get close to the community. So I think one of the reasons why John asked me to talk here is because I'm fascinated that the role the digital public library can play in community, and I think you're a little bit skeptical of the virtual community. I don't want to speak for you, but let me say my thing. Say, okay? say your thing. I'm going to say my thing, which is that I grew up in a town with a 1,000 people. Um, there were 600 families. I can speak very clearly to what it's like to live in a rural community um, and the role that a rural <coughs> community library plays in being a news provider, absolutely, in 1980. Um, and so I think about public libraries very much from the rural standpoint. A lot of times when we think about public libraries, I think we think about urban spaces, right? And that's where people can get to libraries. 56% of communities in the United States do not have libraries in them. Um, there's 19,000 incorporated communities in the United States as of 2015. In 2012, there were 9,000 public libraries. So Right? We're not meeting the need. And so what I think about is, like, what do we do for those other 10,000 communities? Right? What, where do those people go to get um, the experience, whether in person or maybe it's virtually, to launch a rocket into space, to sort of participate in this launching of a satellite, to be in a maker space, um, to have community and connection? Uh, and more personally, I have a 22-year-old child who has severe social anxiety, and so going into a physical space is not really possible for them. And so the experience that lots of kids and other members of our community get who have access to public libraries are actually closed to broad swaths of our community. So how can, and so my child has found this space online, these amazing communities um, of people and connection, and it is, has replicated the experience of being in a physical space online. And, and I, so I have a lot of curiosity about what is the role that the digital public library can, can play in places like the Media Lab, places like the Library Innovation Lab here at Harvard to, to actually extend community, not just information, because I think, yes, what we do as libraries providing information is super important. It's like the bread and butter of our business, right? This is why we have this huge building was for all the books, but you walk through, you see we have less books, more people, right? It's about community, and it's about connection. And I'm really concerned about the 56% of our communities in the United States who don't have access to that kind of community. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I, I agree. It's. I think um, it's kind of interesting how I got to the point where I am because I started being almost uh, like I would introduce myself as I am from the internet uh, because. <laughs> I was so um, optimistic about this new world where we would all connect with each other and speak across boundaries and solve problems together through collaboration. And before I came to the Media Lab, I co-founded a um, nonprofit called Peer-to-Peer -Peer University. And what we tried to do is, is exactly this, bring people together online where they could study things that they were interested in in these virtual communities using open educational resources and Skype and, and these technologies. And we kind of ended up with a similar frustration because we couldn't reach the people who weren't already uh, highly educated, had reliable access, and knew how to navigate this, this online world. So for us then, the face-to-face -face starting to work with public libraries, we made a huge shift a few years ago where now we work exclusively with physical spaces where people get together, they still take the online courses, we still benefit from the resources that exist online, but that face-to-face -face interaction, especially for the audience we were trying to reach, was so valuable um, that we, we kind of made this shift, but I, I haven't fully given up on my idealistic hope, and I mean the reason why I got so uh, en enchanted with the internet back in those days was because you could make these connections with other people. You would find community online in a way that I think I hadn't quite anticipated, right? Like, we are so used to finding community in the physical spaces, and you could make these deep connections in an entirely digital space. For me, it was was incredible. So I think maybe we're coming through this, okay, I was online only, now we're online and offline, and like, hopefully, and maybe that's a role that the DPLA could or should play, is how do we build these strong communities and, and small groups where people support each other who are only going to be interacting with each other online? That's fascinating. What else do you want us to talk about, John? <laughs> are, we're doing okay? Yes? yes. I know, your library's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, no, we're, we are super excited about this. And w the thing that we're um, still grappling with a little bit is, um, so the CubeSat project is amazing, right? Like kids are going to get to build a, so if, uh, CubeSats are these tiny 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter little things that you can uh, include in the um, payload for a, a rocket that goes into space. So it's like a, kind of a standardized size. And you can also stick them together so you can build larger satellites. And they're, you know, they're real satellites. They get tested, they get, they're you know, space worthy. And so we're extremely excited to be uh, doing some of those CubeSat developments. But then what we are also asking is, how do we make that experience accessible to maybe hundreds or thousands of public libraries because they're not all going to build a CubeSat, right? Like you need access to people who can help with the construction and the design. You need some funding. You know, it's, it's uh, building the device isn't that expensive, but actually getting it to the launch gets very expensive with all the testing and the actual uh, payload you have to pay for. So for us, kind of, this is a great experiment to, to do a very high fidelity version that we would like to do with more libraries. But we're also thinking about, well, how can we do this in a thousand libraries? Right. Because they're not all going to build a CubeSat. Um, and, and I'd love, if anyone has any suggestions or ideas, um, I'd love to hear those. Anybody else have questions? Do you have any um, Well, maybe it's a, it's a question for the room a little bit. So because I, um, I, I totally agree, yeah, I think you said it, uh, this is the moment, let's seize the moment, this is the moment for libraries. That's exactly how I feel. And I also see the same enthusiasm in our Media Lab students. Right? People are really, there's something magical about the public library, there's something in the air right now that people are really excited about. But I'm a little bit worried that we're leaning more and more on the public library to provide all of the social services that actually should be provided by other institutions, and we're not shifting the resources that those other institutions had in the past. So I, I, I'm a little worried about us being too excited about public libraries only because they're kind of the last institution left 
Um, and I, I wonder if that's something others are concerned about or have thoughts on. Well, then I think that gets to your point of sort of what can academic libraries, what can other institutions, I mean, I'm sort of keeping it within the library sphere. I do think there's other institutions that need to participate in this. But I, I think that's to your point of what can academic libraries um, contribute. So we, it's hard to say this when you're at Harvard, but we have money issues too, right? Like li all, I know, all libraries have funding issues. There are a limited amount of resources available, but there are um, community members who can go help. So in one way, I think academic libraries can be more, as I said before, be more present in the physical space of the public library is one aspect. And to try to build everything that we build to have it be open access and extendable to public libraries so that they can lean on some of our resources. We can do things at broader scale. So if we're buying space um, on the cloud, maybe we buy a little extra space um, and we let public libraries use that space and that enables some of that sort of innovation and to happen in the public library, um, which would be a light lift for us, I think. That's a really good idea. Uh, so I think I might have just committed myself to that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll go in with you. <laughs> yeah, we could do yeah, it together, we'll do it right? Together. That's yeah. sort of, that feels like a low lift. Or, or we'll convince John to do it with the digital public library. There you go, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, we're on what the other, hook. What do other people we're, we'll think? We'll help. What do other people think? I see a lot of nodding. I'm Ahmad Hansra, I'm a, facu uh, a faculty at the School of Information in Kent State in Ohio and a fellow at Berkman this year. Um, I um, just got a, a IMLS grant to bring AI to public libraries I and mean, data analytics for uh, uh, supporting local communities. Um, I am a data scientist more than a librarian, but I'm sitting in library. And it is fantastic when I hear this, one of the ideas that we had in that Grant is thinking from an innovation ecology perspective that how bigger players, they have a lot of capacity, but they might not get involved in sort of tasks that it is usually uh, designated to smaller players. So if you look at the uh, innovation ecology perspective, if you pass those capabilities to smaller players, the innovation will increase in the community. And I believe that's an excellent idea. If you have cloud computing support and you can share it with public libraries, that is fantastic. Uh, last week we had a kickoff meeting. We brought four uh, public library system people and talked with them. They are so thrilled to learn these new skills, so thrilled to get some of these supports. Uh, and understand how they can use that. So I think this is fantastic if you can partnership and pass some of these capabilities to uh, local public libraries. And, and I, I, I am very um, uh, uh, persuaded that this is gonna help improve innovation in local level and, and, and in different, you know, covering in different ages from high school and even people who are gonna start to small businesses or entrepreneurs. Do you wanna respond? Sure. Uh, yeah, what you said. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that's really interesting. I'm fascinated by it. I would love to have like a conversation with you offline about sort of the notion of artificial intelligence in public libraries. And part of me feels like a creepy Amazon thing about that. And then part of me thinks, wow, that's really interesting. And what could we do in an artificial intelligence space um, in public libraries? And, and I would love to figure out with you, if you want to have a conversation, and figure out other ways that libraries can work together and we can find these, transferring that information downward, I think is really interesting. What do you think about that? I agree. Uh, and actually, do you have a website or something that you want to share with people? Uh, it's next.io uh, with a K. So it's a knowledge extension, but we call it next with a K. And um, actually the domain bought three days ago. It's going to be up next week. Great. Ne next week with a K also? <laughs> Somebody else had their hand up. John Bracken had his hand up. <laughs> so this is building off a conversation we had last week about family. Yeah. I know. 
kid is still sweet. Oh my God. Um, you know, so, okay, so Second Life didn't really work out, but there were a lot of library, librarians hanging out there, and there's some librarians who are still hanging out there. Uh, <laughs> successfully and you know and it is still a legitimate space right that people are using i don't know if it's a second life experience um and i don't think this this is a five-year or a ten-year proposition um but i can imagine a space that is really active and engaged i watch young people and the way that they um are creating these amazing spaces for themselves online outside of the commercial social media paradigm um, where they are building these connections. And maybe the library is not, it might be that the library is not the entity that creates those kinds of communities, but I think it's worth exploring because right now libraries are creating these really amazing communities for people um, who don't have access, right? I don't know how much time you see, uh, I think everybody here is a library fan, but how much time do you spend, unless you're in uh, a public library, just watching people in the public library and how they use that space um, and the amazing ways that human connection is happening. So I, so, so I would challenge the, the digital public library to sort of think about where is the human intersection online? What could it possibly look like? Um, today, tomorrow, 15 years from now, that is building that richness of human connection because I don't, because I, as much as I think face-to-face -face connection is important, it's not possible for a lot of people um, for a number of reasons. Um, and, you know, again, we talked, let's talk to Susan Crawford and help her with the fiber issue, right? So we have to make sure people have connection because my rural kid doesn't get helped unless my rural kid has access to the internet, but setting that problem aside, how do, I, don't, I don't know exactly how you build it, but I imagine it's being an amazing, magical space. Um, yeah, and I'd, I completely agree. And I'd add one uh, that's much less interesting and more boring, but I think also still important, which is um, this idea of open content or open resources. Uh, it's like that was a big topic 10 years ago. Everyone got very excited about that. And I feel like there's kind of a waning enthusiasm. Like people are just don't think that's particularly interesting anymore. And um, when you look at the resources that exist, and it, when I say uh, there's a waning interest, not from me and not from my friends, but I think in general, because um, I see Wendy in the back there kind of. Uh, um, <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but I think there's still, um, there's a real threat to the public domain, to openly licensed uh, content, and I feel there's less public attention and enthusiasm to take on those those issues. And I feel I, I would hope that the uh, Digital Public Library um, of America or the Americas uh, can can cannot take their eye off of that and make sure that we we retain kind of a focus on making sure that those resources are available. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, don't pivot all the way away from content, right? Because that rural kid also needs access to the magical world of books and information, right? Because that's going to unlock a lot of things for those kids, too. Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you called me out here, right? <laughs> Uh, Wendy Seltzer, and uh, I'll, uh, as a copyright lawyer, one of the things I love about libraries is that you know if they didn't exist, you'd be really, really hard pressed to invent them today. <laughs> Physical places that just give out books for to anyone who walks in and lend them out with barely any proof the who you are and that you could pay for all of the content that you're getting access to for free. I mean, it's fantastic, uh, and so I see. Uh, uh, I, I love libraries for, for that role and for their roles as guardians of free speech and anonymity. And, and I think uh, expanding on that concept of what are these other non-rival resources that we can help gain, give people access to uh, as a commons. Um, and let, let's uh, renew that imagination too of what are other resources or the places where people are being asked to identify themselves. Libraries can be a shield from uh, identity by uh, geolocation and IP address and internet connection. 
uh, the places where people are being asked to sort of prove something about themselves. The library can give them a spot from which to do that. Yeah, I think maybe we have time for one more contribution or question. That's a heavy burden. Um, I'm Jenny Rose Helper, and I work at Creative Commons. Obviously, I also still care, as pro probably everybody in this room, still care about openly licensed content. Um, I have a question about um, that in particular and what academic libraries can bring to public libraries. Um, at Harvard, for example, at MIT, you have access to huge repositories, huge databases of materials that are sometimes assigned, that it sometimes have to be found by people in public libraries. And I'm wondering, you know, how can academic libraries take these huge open access initiatives like the one at MIT, like Dash at Harvard, and like the other Harvard open access initiatives, and how can they um, use sort of that energy that is still happening within libraries and um, bring that energy to public libraries in particular um, so that librarians uh, don't have to respond, no, I'm sorry, we don't have access to that resource. No, I'm sorry, you can only see an EBSCO snippet. Uh, no, I'm sorry, you can only see the abstract of this PubMed article. How can um, you know, the riches of these huge repositories that are you know, largely commercial uh, be brought to public libraries? I don't have a microphone. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm loath to answer that question as our university librarian is sitting in front of me, Sarah Thomas, and Suzanne Wones is in the back of the room, who is a, the Harvard Library Digital Strategy Librarian, um, and Francisca Frey, who's the Chief of Staff of the Harvard Libraries, and I cannot speak on behalf of Harvard at all in that context. I mean, I think that, that um, your question about how you extend out information that is stuck behind paywalls, so much of our content is stuck behind paywalls. It's a huge issue. And in academic libraries, we're, our hands are tied in lots of ways because we need to get that content to our patrons. Um, academic libraries are trying to work with publishers um, to try and help them see their way toward more open access content um, that does not delegitimize their need to make a profit. Uh, so it's kind of a weird balance for some of those companies to be in. Um, you know, we continue to digitize what we can. I uh, think we sort of intellectually lean pretty heavily on Brewster at the Internet Archive, who is really seems to be prepared to take it on the chin with the publishers um, to make his content of, to make content available that is in copyright. And so I think those are some ways. I'm not answering your question. Uh, because it's a hard question to answer. We're restricted by licenses. It's all about money, right? And so, I mean, quite honestly, right now, what I'm trying to do is get vendors to make their content that I have to buy and restrict be accessible to people who have different abilities. And I'm, you know, I'll take up the open access thing after I can make sure that a blind person can actually get access to all of the information that we subscribe to. Uh, since nobody from MIT is here, I can... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to make everything available. No, um, uh, uh, I, I think, um, well, one is I, I liked in the earlier conversation um, the charge to the DPLA to be more of an activist and kind of take on the, the thorny issues. And I think institutions like MIT, or at least the Media Lab, would be happy to be allies in that, right? So... Uh, Maybe we wouldn't be the one that makes the first step, but I think we'd want to be part of a club that, that kind of takes on those issues. Um, I think internally we have a responsibility to just make sure everything we produce is openly licensed and accessible and reachable. Um, and so at the Media Lab, we do have a pretty good open uh, access policy that applies both to uh, research publications and uh, software. So the default is open source. Um, and I think CC BY uh, for, for publications. Um, we can probably do more in, in terms of doing that for all of MIT, but I know Chris Bork, who isn't here, the MIT librarian, is very active uh, in that space and really trying to push the institute to do more. Um, and I think we have a responsibility to be a, kind of a leader, right? Like as we did with OpenCourseWare, 
um, which really opened the floodgates for universities to say, oh, they realized that the content wasn't the most valuable thing about going to a, a university. And then they started uh, making their content available. I think in the same way, we should be more of a leader again and, and kind of uh, do the same thing in the online course space, for example, where many of the MOOCs, which are called massive open online courses, are actually not open at all. Uh, the materials are not openly licensed. When the course has run, you can't access it anymore. Um, but um, I know Griff had a question, but I, I just got the signal, so maybe we can, uh, yeah, I got the, uh, there's also, also we're the, like, in the, we're the only thing between them and that. Uh, oh, you are, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I I'll be brief and just, I guess, say three things since I am between you and, and, the, and Harvard's alcohol. Um, first, I want to, where did she go? One, another one of my board members just walked in. Jenny, where did you go? I just saw you. Jenny Lee is also here. I introduced the other board members a minute ago. Um, second, I want to acknowledge the DPLA staff who are here, who have been here longer than I have. Ariel, who's taking notes right now and working. Michael and Michelle are all here, and I hope if you don't know them, you'll get a chance to know them. And third, I want to thank the Berkman folks in particular, Harvard in general, and Berkman in particular, especially Alba, for without whom this event wouldn't have happened, so thank you so much. Two members of the Berkman staff who would have been here otherwise are down with the flu, so that means she did three people's jobs at least today. Um, and, and I think it's great that Jenny and Wendy actually were both called out, because like DPLA, um, chillingeffects.org, which Wendy started and nurtured inside of Berkman. Uh, Creative Commons was started and nurtured inside of the Berkman Center. So many other projects, public radio exchange, uh, podcasting in many respects was invented here. Um, we're really proud of that heritage and, and really glad that the, I'm really glad that my first event with my DPLA hat on was here with, with you guys. So thank you to the Berkman and Harvard teams. Um, and the last bit I want to say is I want to also thank our landlord, David Leonard, who's here from Boston Public Library. I think that relationship is one that we're, we're really excited about um, driving forward and strengthening, and I don't just call him my landlord. He's become a good friend and advisor as well. Um, look, I've got a long list of ideas and mandates that came from a lot of you. I noticed, if you notice, Philip was pitching me on ideas, which is something he's used to doing when I had my last job. I love all those ideas. I don't have a checkbook anymore, Philip, but I love this idea of we should be part of a club uh, taking on these larger issues and this, this notion of a participatory platform that, that Maura and Bob and Mary Lee and so many of you others have have handed to us, I think we take on as a real strong mandate and uh, hope that you all will be part of that journey with us, help to continue to push us and support us in the next five and 10 and 20 years in the long game. So thank you all for coming on a Friday before the Super Bowl weekend. Uh, and uh, I hope you can hang out for a bit and, and chat. <laughs>